I'll now turn to Chairman Salmon for five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to kind of follow along the same line of questioning uh, as the Chairman, uh, Chairman Duncan, started with uh, U.S. involvement, U.S. Uh, presence in the region. And I'm going to turn to you, Dr. Ellis, first. I, I, I believe that Chairman Duncan is frustrated. I know we've had conversations that while the U.S. presence in the region seems to be not as strong as it could be. There have been a vacuum, I think, Ms. Myers, you, you referenced that. And while China's influence seems to be growing in the region, my question is, if we could get a TPP agreement, would China's influence in the region grow? Would the United States' influence in the region grow? Or would it diminish on either, on either side? Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Solomon. I, I think you raise an, an excellent question, and uh, I indeed in my own writings have been a strong advocate uh, of, of the TPP, but certainly an effective and well-negotiated final uh, T TPP. Uh, what I see is for both our Asian partners and our Latin American partners, the question is this emerging importance of the Trans-Pacific. Um, what is the rules that governs economic interactions? Will it be a Pacific in which uh, the states which are larger and better able to coordinate their government and financial and commercial institutions can kick open the door, uh, bring away intellectual property, uh, impose their labor laws and, and workers on others, or is it, a rule, or is it a, a rule of law Pacific environment in which there is respect for labor laws, in which there is respect for intellectual property, in which uh, all states have the opportunity to reap the fruit of their hard work and good policies, whether Japan or China or otherwise. Um, I certainly as, am, am a strong advocate of um, a, a, a future TPP, which remains open to China, but one in which uh, we have a prosperous Pacific in which China and the other players uh, play by the rules. And, and I believe that that creates a, a bigger pie for, for all parts of the Pacific community. Well, in some parts of uh, the Western Hemisphere, there still are some serious governance mm -hmm. and rule of law concerns, issues. Yes. Uh, some corruption issues, uh, human rights abuses, lack of environmental consciousness, and organized violence in some parts of the Western Hemisphere. So is that political and economic climate in the region, is it gonna hamper China's ability to be able to function effectively or uh, navigate in the region? Or are they pretty adept at navigating with these types of relationships? Could they serve as a model for greater government accountability and respect for the rule of law for these countries? Or does China perpetuate these problems? An excellent question. Uh, China is very careful uh, not to impose its own concept of a model, but very happy to allow others to draw from China the lessons that they will. Uh, what concerns me is, in many ways, there is a new ideological struggle that I see of the 21st century, um, it represented to some degree by the model of states such as the Alba states, a very statist concept of, of how you negotiate with uh, Asia versus uh, that which is represented by, for, for example, our, our, our partners, uh, the, the Trans-Pacific uh, Trans Partnership. But, but as well as the Alliance of the Pacific. Um, what concerns me in states like Nicaragua, in, in Ecuador, and in, in others uh, uh, to, to a certain extent, uh, Bolivia, etc., is that the opportunity to have Chinese money allows populist leaders to, uh, to, to do direct relationships, which gets them away from accountability and oversight that is previously imposed by institutions such as the Inter-American Development Bank, etc. And in many ways, the reason why China has loaned so much to Venezuela, over $55 billion, but has had very little success in the projects that they have pursued very hard in countries like Mexico and Colombia and elsewhere, is that those countries have established laws and institutions and strong bureaucracies um, and are less willing to bend to the Chinese rules, whereas countries such as Venezuela has been more willing to do state-to-state -state deals. And at the end, at the end of the day, that disadvantages not only Western businesses, but I believe disadvantages uh, the rule of law in the region. It encourages corruption and bad governance, and um, really it prejudices the, the people of, of the region and their long-term democratic interests and development, I believe. I'm going to paraphrase then. What I'm, what I'm hearing you saying is that if the United States isn't deeply engaged through activities like TPP, if we're not leaders in the region, then there is a vacuum that's filled by others. Is that something others on the committee would agree with or on the panel would agree with, that if we're not actively engaged in determining what the rules of the road are for engagement, 
in the Western Hemisphere. If we're not the leader through things like TPP, then countries like China have greater authority to dictate those rules of the road. Is that sounds, looks, like, looks like most of you agree with that. The other thing that, uh, the question I wanted to ask is that with some of the economic woes that are happening in China domestically, is that going to impact their ability to be able to interact in the region with some of the, you know, financial crisis that they've been going through? Do you think, Ms. Myers, that's going to impact their ability to be able to uh, complete the agenda? Uh, certainly we've already seen a, a pretty remarkable de decrease in trade with Latin America, especially in, in South America, commodities trade over the past year in particular, but also before that. Um, also, turbulence in Chinese markets in the Shanghai Stock Exchange and then the recent devaluation of the UN has had effect on global markets, obviously, and then so also has affected Latin America quite considerably and especially, again, commodities exporters, Chile, Peru, uh, and others. And so in the short term, yes, there's a considerable effect on Latin America, and this is troubling to many. In the medium to long term, I think, uh, well, in the medium term at least, we'll see considerably more demand still for, for Chinese goods, for Chinese commodities, in, I'm sorry, for Latin American commodities in particular, and for Chinese goods in Latin America. These things aren't going to change immediately. Growth has slowed in trade, but it's still growing. Um, and China very much is looking not only to Latin America, but to other regions for raw materials, of course, but also to help it facilitate its reform process. So many of these investments promote, for example, economic upgrading, which is a major element of reform, or the use of excess steel uh, in China, and that's a major problem in, in the domestic Chinese economy. So we'll see more, absolutely.